Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share the Coffee, Health, and Science Podcast with a friend, with a colleague. We do appreciate you spreading the show. It is how we grow. Make sure to give us a good rating and review and subscribe to the show. It helps push us up in the rankings. And of course, check out the Purity Heroes campaign, puritycoffee.com, matching new orders and donating to frontline workers, as well as healthcare workers getting 30% off at puritycoffee.com. Today's show is another exciting coffee history episode. After the smashing success of the last installment, we decided that we had to put another one into production. If you haven't had a chance to go back and listen to the last coffee history, Four Times Coffee Was Criminalized, please do go back and listen to that incredible episode. You will not be disappointed. Today's installment, though, revolves around a different kind of theme. Instead of focusing on a certain time period or specific events during coffee's rise to prominence as a global beverage, today we are focusing on the historical figures themselves, specifically the many historical geniuses that were openly and proudly hooked on coffee. From timelessly wise philosophers, to boundlessly brilliant composers, to legendary founding fathers, when you begin to look at history through the lens of coffee, you see just how impactful this drink was on the course of mankind's progression. So I hope you've got a cup of coffee ready. Let's dive together into today's piece entitled Coffee-Fueled Genius. The first historically impactful coffee addict we will be discussing today needs no backstory or introduction. We thought him to be so important in my country that we put him on the $100 bill. None other than Benjamin Franklin himself. And I don't think there could be a better figure to start with. I mean, since I began producing this coffee history series, the one thing that has really stuck with me and surprised me was the effect that coffee and coffee houses had on institutions. If you listen to Four Times Coffee Was Criminalized, our last coffee history episodes, you learned that so many leaders throughout the centuries have all had the same concerns about coffee culture, that essentially, coffee expands the minds of the citizens and gets them talking amongst each other, and the coffee houses end up being breeding grounds for revolutionary ideas. These leaders who held power preferred taverns for their people to gather, where citizens would just get sloshed, be merry, and less frequently get into the topics like the way things should be in society. And it was no different in the late 1700s in revolutionary America. After the famous Boston Tea Party incident, Americans largely switched over from drinking tea to drinking coffee, as coffee was seen as the more patriotic beverage. Coffee shops called penny houses sprang up everywhere, where coffee only cost a penny, and you could sit with your fellow patriotic Americans and discuss the revolution. And within these Boston penny houses, you were likely to find the great Benjamin Franklin himself, truly one of the most fascinating founding fathers. Much of Franklin's personal beliefs were in line with those same conversations held in coffee houses around the world for centuries. Issues of human rights, freedom, and revolution. This is a man who pushed for the abolition of slavery in the late 1700s, almost 100 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. Although Franklin was known for his love of alcohol as well, he considered coffee to be the most virtuous of beverages. And he wasn't afraid to share his succinct opinions about the beverage, just as with everything else in his life. I'll leave you with a quote about coffee to cap off this section, attributed to the great Benjamin Franklin. Among the numerous luxuries of the table, coffee may be considered as one of the most valuable. It excites cheerfulness without intoxication, and the pleasing flow of spirits which it occasions is never followed by sadness, languor, or debility. Benjamin Franklin Let's now travel across the Atlantic to a place where coffee history has taken us before, 18th century France. The coffee addict in question is maybe the heaviest consumer when it comes to coffee geniuses, as it is said that the French philosopher known as Voltaire was said to drink 20, 40, even 50 cups of coffee every single day. 
It's said that Voltaire started drinking coffee at 5 a.m. each morning and virtually never stopped drinking through the evening. His desire for coffee was even coined as an obsession by some accounts. A report contemporary to the time reads, quote, Voltaire dined in Paris that night at a coffee house with a few other literary men. He arrived rather late. He had come straight from Versailles. He made his dinner, after his frugal fashion, off seven or eight cups of black coffee and a couple of rolls, and was very talkative and amusing, end quote. Voltaire would pay exorbitant prices to have specialty coffee imported to France from around the globe, an incredible luxury for the time. He openly ignored the advice of his physician, who warned that the extreme levels of coffee consumption would kill him. But knowing what we now know, apparently Voltaire was getting some decent quality coffee, because he lived to be an astonishing 83 years old in a time when average life expectancy was just 25 to 35 years. For those unfamiliar with Voltaire's work, I highly recommend you dig into his history. Voltaire was driven by reason and believed that no institution, religious or political or otherwise, should be immune to being challenged by reason. This goes hand in hand once again with the intellectual stimulation that comes from coffee culture. It's no wonder that Voltaire was fond of the drink and fond of spending his hours in his favorite Paris coffee house discussing the nature of man, politics, God, and more. I'd like to share with you a few Voltaire quotes that are pertinent to the attitude we've been discussing throughout this series. It is better to risk saving a guilty man than to condemn an innocent one. Think for yourselves and let others enjoy the privilege to do so too. Judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. Every man is guilty of all the good he did not do. And finally, my personal favorite, let us cultivate our own garden. For our next historical figure, we travel eastward to Germany to experience the majesty of one of the greatest musicians and composers to ever grace humanity, Ludwig van Beethoven. Born in Germany on an unknown date in 1770, performing his first concerts before he was eight years old. It's hard to explain just how much of an impact Beethoven had on the progression of music. When we talk about these revolutionary thinking processes that coffee encourages, Beethoven applied the same attitude to his music. He shattered decades-long rules that composers played by, changing song structures and progressions, changing which instruments led pieces and which instruments followed. Beethoven was a rock star in his time, and some argue that he single-handedly pulled music from the classical era into the modern era by the way, composing while deaf for much of his life. An eccentric genius, totally consumed by the musical arts, he was also truly obsessive about his coffee consumption. Beethoven would drink a cup for breakfast every day, but the extraordinary relationship with coffee didn't come from the level of consumption like it had with Voltaire. Instead, with Beethoven, it was the method of preparation. Beethoven would personally hand-count exactly 60 beans of coffee to prepare for each serving, counting them himself and often double-checking the number. Interestingly enough, 60 beans, on average, weighs 7.9 grams, remarkably close to the 8 grams used in espresso preparation. It seems like Beethoven was onto something with the 60-count bean cup, and boy, he knew exactly how he wanted his coffee. There's a wonderful article on the website greenfarmcoffee.shop where they reproduce Beethoven's coffee recipe using 60 counted out beans and a balloon siphon coffee maker, which would have been similar to the French balloon coffee makers contemporary for Beethoven's time. I highly recommend checking out this article, and if you're a fan of the mad composer, you can finally consume coffee the exact same way that he did. There's really something to be said about the removal of creative blockages with the use of coffee. And I think that's one of the reasons why artists and musicians gravitate towards the drink so much. I may have to do a whole coffee history episode on creativity and coffee in the future, 
as I think that would prove to be a very fascinating episode. We've reached the end of our list of historical coffee addicts, and in my opinion, I certainly saved the best for last. It's hard to top Beethoven, the genius rock star composer who hand-counted his beans. But if there's someone who could give him a run for his money in the world of genius and coffee consumption, it was the great Johann Sebastian Bach. A predecessor to Beethoven, Bach had similarly large impacts on the world of music as a whole, oftentimes integrating rhythms and textures from other cultures into the German classical music scene. Bach was a great student of music, and his years of study and hard work composing landed him easily high upon the list of most influential musicians of all time. But today we're focusing on one single piece that Bach composed that many of you may not have heard. You may or may not be familiar with a piece that Bach wrote around 1732, whose title translates to Be Still, Stop Chattering. The piece is better known as the Coffee Cantata. You see, Bach was living in that exact same time of coffee demonization that we've explored. Late 1600s, early 1700s. I mean, Germany was rife with anti-coffee sentiment for all the reasons that we've discussed in this series. And that didn't sit well with Bach, who loved to drink coffee and thought that the anti-coffee hysteria was just that, pure madness. So Bach went ahead and adapted a poem about coffee that one of his compatriots had written into a full-blown coffee cantata. And I have to hand it to them. The coffee cantata is humorous, it's relatable, it's timeless, it's satirical, it's witty. In my opinion, it's downright genius. The coffee cantata is essentially a dialogue between a man and his daughter. And the Lord is demanding that his daughter stop drinking coffee. But as the conversation unfolds, it becomes apparent that the woman would rather give up everything else in her life than give up her precious coffee. I'd like to play you a section of the great coffee cantata now, as well as read to you some of the translated lyrics in English. You bad child, you wild girl. Oh, if only I could have my way. Get rid of coffee. Father, don't be so hard. If three times a day I can't drink my little cup of coffee, then I would become so upset that I would be dried up like a piece of roast goat. If you don't give up your coffee, you won't be going to any wedding, and you won't go out walking either. All right then, just leave me my coffee. I'll get the little minx now. I shan't get you the latest fashion in just your size. I can do easily without that. You are not to stand at the window, and you won't see anyone going by. I don't mind that either, but please, I beg you, just let me keep my coffee. What's more, you won't get from me a silver or gold ribbon to put on your bonnet. That's fine, just leave me my pleasure. Now follow what your father says. In everything else, but not coffee. That concludes today's episode of Coffee History. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. This is truly one of my favorite types of pieces to produce. If you enjoy it, please let us know. Subscribe, rate, and review. It's how you can give us your feedback and help us grow. We sure appreciate it. We've got some great coffee history coming at you, some more Dr. Coffee episodes coming up shortly. Really good stuff coming on the Coffee Health and Science podcast. I cannot thank you listeners enough. This is Jordan River signing off. Wishing you an extraordinary day. We'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. 